Welcome to Finite Element Methods. Today we'll be discussing another special topic and that's nonlinear finite elements. What is nonlinear finite elements? What are we talking about here? So there's two types of behaviors. You can have a linear behavior in the material and geometry, or you could have a nonlinear behavior in geometry and material. For example, in a particular material could be could behave with plasticity, for example, or hyperelasticity. So that material will be a nonlinear material, and it will have to be analyzed using nonlinear finite elements. Another type of nonlinearity is geometric nonlinearity, and that geometric nonlinearity will stem from situations where we're considering large deformations, large strains, large rotations, and in those cases, we cannot use infinitesimal strain assumption, we have to consider second order terms that will then help us be able to simulate the large deflections and large strains. And nonlinear finite elements is an approach that allow us to consider these two effects, uh, geometric nonlinearity, material nonlinearity, uh, in order to solve these problems. We also have a another type of nonlinearity, and that will be contact, for example, and any type of uh, constraints that you may encounter, those will be also analyzed using nonlinear finite elements. Another type could be a non uh, a follower force where the force direction is changing as the deformation occurs. In those cases, nonlinear finite elements may be most appropriate in those scenarios. So let's go and dive into this topic and learn how we can go ahead and solve these type of problems in a very top level way. Uh, the, the, this course is intended to provide the basics and with some advanced concepts that you will encounter in real life. So for nonlinear finite elements, uh, typically uh, uh, in a linear problem, uh, the strains, uh, actually the full strain, green Lagrange strain tensor, is uh, six components that includes the higher order terms. Uh, but for the linear uh, problem, these higher order terms are neglected. And this can be neglected when you have small displacements, small gradients, small rotations. And so in abacus, uh, for example, if you turn in, in the step definition, star, step, comma, NLGM, you make that null, is going to use uh, small strains, approximations. It makes sense if the strains are small, say it's 1%, so 0.01 times 0.01, what is that? 0.001, it's really small compared to this strain. This is going to be dominating the strain uh, value. So, so small strain makes sense if you're less than 1% to 2%. Um, another thing is if you're just looking at linear stress-strain relationships, so here's a stress-strain curve of metal, and I'm only in this regime, then it makes sense to just do a linear analysis. Uh, in, in that case, uh, you're, you're basically, um, it's a simpler analysis, right? Uh, another thing you can, you can do if, if the analysis, you, you, you think that, um, uh, you know, a stress strain curve looks like this, but I wanna run the model without having to do the nonlinear analysis, I could just run it linearly and if the stress concentration at the, at the hole, the stress concentration, the stresses are not higher than the ultimate, you're, it's probably conservative. It's probably enough for you to stop there. But if now you have a stress that's five times the ultimate strength of the material, maybe you wanna switch to stress strain curve uh, uh, and use a full curve and do a nonlinear analysis, which is what this is here. So in a nonlinear problem, uh, the strains can be very large, and you may want to consider them. Uh, for example, buckling is an example. So the problems you guys are working on, the buckling problem, that is a nonlinear problem because you're going to have high deformations in that wall that have to be considered. Uh, material nonlinearity is another source of, uh, so basically it's nonlinear stress strain curve. Um, kinematic nonlinearity, where your boundary conditions are changing, that's a source of nonlinearity. Uh, or follower, follower lo loads. It's a small mistake. Follower, so the load follows how the structure deforms. 
in this case, there's also a nonlinear problem that needs to be considered. Any questions on this? You guys understand the sources of non nonlinearities? I'll give some examples. Yeah, if you, if you run a linear analysis and there's a stress concentration in the model, say, if the stress is, if you can write positive margins for that structure with a linear analysis, you're probably going to be okay. But if the stresses give you a huge stress compared to the strength of the material, it may be worth doing a little more homework and studying, putting put the nonlinear stress strain curve and study how that stress concentration behaves, right? Because now you're going to properly account for the fact that there's plasticity at the hole and that the stress distribute, distributes much better at the hole than it will have with a linear analysis. Um, so, typ typical material uh, properties uh, include nonlinear elastic, plastic, hyperelastic, viscoelastic, viscoplastic, abacus has hyperelastic, has all these material models. Uh, temperature dependent thermal conductivity, I'll give you an example of that really quick. Geometric nonlinearity, so large deformations, large kinematic problems, sorry, kinematic problems where there's large deformations, large rotations. Uh, buckling analysis that you guys are doing right now. Boundary conditions where the contact is occurring, that's going to be a nonlinear problem because now the boundary condition depends on the geometry and the deformations of the parts. Um, or if you have a thermal, thermal problem where there's phase changes, that's going to be a very different problem as well. Um, here's an example of a 1D bar. I could take a, a nonlinear uh, um, stress strain curve, or I can include a null. So normally we just include this, but for large deformations, I can include this term. Okay. If I include this term and I include a stress strain curve that looks like that, and none of these are linear, then my stiffness matrix is going to depend on the deflection. Normally, the stiffness matrix does not depend on the deflection. You agree? Usually, when you calculate it for all your problems with the stiffness matrix, depending on the deflection, no, it was a constant value. You inverted K and you got the deflections, right? Is that what you did? Correct. And so now if the stiffness depends on the deflections, right? Now I have to solve this in a different way, okay? We'll cover a little bit about that coming up. Again, I, this is a more of an advanced class, so I'll cover very, very top level. Um, I'll teach you the fundamentals of the methods used in Abacus to solve this, but I will not be able to teach you uh, uh, the, the more advanced nonlinear fine elements. I'll cover very top level. A contact problem, for example, when I take this ball and I apply a load against this uh, uh, rigid boundary, uh, you expect this boundary to impart a load, a contact pressure on this ball that flattens that, that ball. And so in this case, uh, the amount of load I impart also changes the amount of pressure that I'm applying and the amount of width. And so your boundary condition is changing clearly here. And so now, again, the stiffness matrix depends on the deflection, which is what you're trying to solve for, so it's a nonlinear problem. Let's take an example of thermal conductivity. Uh, and radiation is actually a nonlinear problem as well. Um, because you have, in radiation, you have uh, temperature to the fourth. I think the, the equation will have temperature to the fourth. That's a nonlinear problem. You have to use nonlinear solution techniques to solve that. Uh, but here is the easy one. Conductivity depends on temperature. So clearly here, when I go to my uh, stiffness matrix, remember it's BDB, but in our case it's K because it's conductive capacitance is our, uh, our stiffness matrix of heat transfer problems. Uh, you can see the boundary conditions also depend on this K. So K is a function of temperature. So here, again, I can put it into this form where K depends on temperature, and temperature is what I'm trying to solve for. So it's a nonlinear problem. I cannot just invert this because I'm, I don't know K. K depends on T, and, and, and T is what I'm trying to solve for. Very nonlinear problem. Got to find a way of solving that. In Abacus, uh, because I won't cover this in extensive detail, uh, in Abacus, to activate nonlinearity, so for material nonlinearity, you'll put uh, star, star plastic, 
Uh, so after star elastic, you give the modulus, the Poisson ratio. Star plastic will give you the opportunity to put in there the stress-strain curve. And so you put the yield stress, and then you put the plastic strain here. And so you'll just number them all the way down. So you'll take the stress-strain curve and put that in there. Make sure you are putting the correct... Um, so say I go to a test lab and get uh, the stress-strain curve of the material. Uh, that data product that may be provided to you is an engineering stress, engineering strain. And, and depending upon the code, whether it's Abacus or Nastran or ANSYS or all these different codes, they may ask you to put in their engineering stress versus engineering strain, or they may ask you to put the true stress versus true strain, and so you may have to convert it uh, to those. Okay, just keep that in mind. Um, and also, Star Plastic uh, also has other options in Abacus, such as isotropic hardening, kinematic hardening. You guys can go and look at those options for your ships. We won't have time to cover all the plasticity models that exist, but I do encourage you to go through the manual or take a plasticity book and learn about the different plastic material models that exist, plasticity models that exist. To activate nonlinear geometry, just make this equals to yes. I, I forgot the word yes, and this will activate large deflection theory as well. You have a question? Excellent. Here's an example. Uh, I want to show you this example. It's the simplest example I can think of to teach you nonlinear fine elements uh, or, or how, a little bit about how to solve this in a quick way. Okay, so pay attention here and I think you'll follow it. Say I have a load that I apply of 16 pounds, but my modulus now depends on the deflection of this beam, of this bar, and the deflection it, it, and the modulus depends on 20 u squared. So usually the modulus is constant, you agree? But I'm going to make it, I made it up. I made it up so that the, now the modulus is 20 times how much the deflection moves. So if the deflection is 1 inch, now the modulus is 20. If the deflection is half inch, then my modulus is now 5. So now it's dependent, and my modulus is now depending on the deflection of, of the structure. EA over L, so for A is 1, L is 10, E is 20 U squared. So if you calculate this, you get 2 U squared. Hopefully I did the math correctly. Check it for me. Uh, so the equilibrium equation for this problem is KU equals F. K typically is AEA over L. In my case, it's 2 U squared. So I have U there, and then F is 16 pounds. So I have 8, uh, sorry, I have 2 U cubed equals 16. You agree? Yeah? If I put everything to one side of the equation, uh, this is u cubed minus 8 equals 0. I will call this the residual. Now, please do not confuse this residual with the residual function from weak form glurking. It's not the same thing. Okay? This is just the error you incur. If, if I start and I say, okay, u is 0, is that the correct solution? Are you here? Are you following anything I said? Yes? So if I put 0, I get an error of minus 8. That's not right. You know the solution is u equals 2. I just created a, a, an example that is probably not that realistic. The next example I have is much more realistic. But in this example, clearly not realistic. But I'll show you how to solve this nonlinear equation, okay, using even Excel. We can do this in Excel really quick. Um, so to do that, we're going to use... Our favorite thing in the whole universe is Taylor series expansion. I'll show you how to do that. So I'm going to solve for you. And again, I, I can't tell Abacus, hey, I have this huge number of nonlinear system of equations. Can you solve it exactly for me? He won't do that for you. We need to find a systematic approach, right? Because that's the whole point of finance, of solving these nonlinear equations. So in this case, uh, what you can do is use Taylor series expansion. Let's go to that. So R U. So what you do is okay. Uh, R U plus D U. Let me check what R U plus U D U is. And so if I do a Taylor series expansion uh, about U, I get this equals R U plus R derivative of R respect to U D U. You agree with this equation? Everybody agrees with this. Yeah. What is my goal? What is my goal? I want this to be what? 
Yes, I want the future to be zero. I want this residual as a move forward in time to be zero because that's, I want to get u cubed equals minus eight equals zero. I want to get that u equals two. So if I want to make that happen, I need to make that to zero, okay? And so if I go here, let me call u plus du equals the u nu, the new value of displacement. And let me call u the old value of displacement so that u old plus the change in u that I'm making is a new displacement, okay? So therefore, this is u, u new, this is u old, and these are u old, and this is delta u, okay? So if I want to make the future zero, you agree that this is zero then? If I want to make it zero, I want to force it to zero? Yeah? You guys track? I'll continue here. So, um, so this is zero. So that's R u old, R prime u old du, okay? And so I, what I want to do is solve for du, and that's easy. Just, I just solve for du right there, right? So just bring this to the other side of the equation, divided by R prime u old, and that's what I get. So now the prediction on how to improve, if I start with u equals zero, my u old is zero. That's not correct. Zero cubed minus eight is minus eight. That's not giving me the right solution. So, so that's not right. If I put u equals zero, that's minus eight. That's not giving me the right solution. So if, for me to improve that solution, to correct it, I take this old value of u, okay, and I correct by du, and du is given by this equation, okay? And uh, you, you saw how I derived that so, so quickly. All right, so, so let's see. For our case, what is r u old? No. General formula. Just give me the general formula. So R was U cubed minus 8. So what is R U old? U old cubed minus 8, right? What is R prime? 3 U squared U old. Sorry, 3 U old squared, right? Sorry about that. Okay, so that's, the, that's how you get to DU. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what we've done here. I, I did it here for you, actually. I, I did it here. And then what I did, I went to Excel which is very visually appealing to me. So put u old here, right? I, I will start with the value of six, just for the heck of it, right? We know that six is not correct. The six cubed minus eight is way off from zero. That's not the right solution. I get r u old, which is 208, 208, which is this equation here, is what I programmed there. u prime, r, r prime is uh, this, this here, three u squared, so I take six, I put it there, and I do this calculation. And then I take this ratio here, and the minus of that gives me the change that I need to make, right? So I need to make a change to u old of minus 1.92. So 6 minus 1.92 gives me 4.07. And now I'll use this new prediction of u, start over, and redo that. And you can see here quickly that about four or five iterations, I get to a value of 2 for u, okay? So I get the value of u, which is 2. Okay, now I don't know if you re you've noticed. Have you run Abacus and look at the message file? You should look at it. You should open the message file, and you will see that Abacus for the buckling problem, particularly, is actually iterating to try to get to the final answer. It's doing this. Is is applying Newton Raphson procedure, Newton's method. This is called Newton's method, by the way, to solve this equation. Now, this is a single equation, right? For multiple variables, we have to get a little bit fancy, right? So my residual now depends on deflections. So, uh, right, so, sorry, it depends on a bunch of equations I have. How many equations I have, you have a million degrees of freedom? Huh? I have a million. So I'll have a million equations. So I'll, I'll have a vector of residual forces, or residuals, right? That's basically uh, that. Uh, one one thing that I actually forgot to point out: when you you're using Newton-Raphson procedure, 
you're actually trying to find equilibrium state because isn't this a load applying eight? Well, it was 16, but this is basically your forcing function right here, right? And so I'm trying to find internal forces in the body that actually make this equal to zero. So in fact, when you're actually solving Newton's method, you're trying to find equilibrium. And that's what Abacus tells you equilibrium iteration one, equilibrium iteration two, three, if you look at the message file, is because you're actually trying to solve to get equilibrium so that the internal forces in the body equilibrate the external force applied of 16 pounds. Okay, and the solution for this problem is that U needs to be two, equal to two, to get it to equilibrate the external force. Does that make sense? Uh, it's going to use uh, zero as an initial guess. And then it's going to, as you apply it, you're going to increase the load slowly. Then it's going to calculate what the new U is as you move forward in time. Abic is going to start with zero, u equals zero. No displacement. Unless you have a previous step where you apply a static load that's going to start from that displacement that you started as your initial guess moving forward. Excellent. So uh, now let's go to, to million degrees of freedom. So I have million equations. Uh, you'll have to do pair perform Taylor series expansion, same procedure actually. But now you have a million of this uh, and you have to do now the gradient of R and the gradient of R, uh, I'm sorry guys, but I have to tell you that the name of the gradient of R in this method is called Jacobian too. Okay, so don't confuse this Jacobian with the Jacobian from isoparametric formulation is not the same. Uh, so it's the derivative of R respect to each of the displacements. So you have to calculate this matrix, which is fairly large. You have to calculate this. It will be million by a million, okay, uh, in this example. And you'll have to then calculate the... So do you agree that the future, I want the residual to be zero, right? So then I have to solve for this d, d, delta U. And so then I have to take this to the other side of the equation, invert this, and so that's why I have this equation to, to correct the, 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 the deflection. So u nu is u all plus a correction du, which is based on that formula. And so that's what I get there. Okay. So that's a correction. You guys have any questions on this? No questions on this? An example works really well. Uh, two equations, two unknowns, nonlinear. Um, and so I want to solve for u1 and u2. Of course, the solutions will be, uh, can be found when these two curves, so if I plot this and I plot this, where these two curves inter in intersect is the solution. So we can actually solve this graphically and check our solution, isn't it? So now what I want you to think about here, I want to think about this. You have a million equations, right? A million unknowns. So somehow these million equations, if you could plot it in the nth dimensional space, these are all somehow at some point, they're gonna intersect at one single point, okay? Right? To give you the solution for the problem. However, there is a potential. There's a potential that in a nonlinear problem you have multiple solutions because don't you agree that sometimes you can have two equations that intersect each other multiple times. So you could have multiple solutions to a nonlinear problem. So, so keep that in mind. Okay, so um, you can find the gradient of R really quickly, which is derivative of R respect to U1. You guys can try that. So derivative of R respect to U1, R1 respect to U1 is uh, minus four, minus four U1. There you go. No. Shoot, no, there you go, it's correct, right? And then the rate of R1 respect to U2, is that right? Yep, and then so forth. You guys can check that, okay? And so once you calculate this gradient, right? You have this gradient, tell me if I'm right or not. I already have this, don't I? I have to just invert it to get this. And R bold U is easy, it's a vector, which is evaluated at U old. Once I have this multiplication, I correct it to u old by adding to u old and I'll get u new. Okay. I actually did that in Excel. <laughs> I don't want to confuse you too much, but 
I took I took the value of x. Now I'm using x's here instead of u1 and u2. Pardon me about that. But by the time I was done, it was too late. I couldn't. It would be taking me too long. But uh, any time, time you see x, just pretend it's u1. So u1 old, u2 old. I made a 0.5 and 1 just for fun. And so then I can calculate my vector r1 and r2. Okay, so instead of f, I also messed up. It's r1 and r2. I can get that. Then I can calculate Jacobian and the inverse of the Jacobian. And then I can get dx as j inverse times f, that column f. And so if I take this dx, this du, basically, this vector, and correct the, the guess that I had, I'll get the new pair for, u, for displacements, u1 and u2. Then I can use this as my new guess, and I can continue this for, uh, all the way down. You can see here how I'm actually, it's basically approaching uh, a, a, val a dx of almost zero. So I start with a large dx, and these dx's are fairly zero, which means I'm approaching the right solution, the correct solution. So it took me about three iterations to get there. And so you can see that I actually got it right. Um, here is the plot uh, for one of the equations, and here's a plot for the other equation. It intersects here and here, and my solution here matches the intersection uh, here, okay? Really, really well, okay? So that's nonlinear uh, uh, Newton-Raphson procedure for you in a one-on-one -on -one course on that, really quick. Uh, is there any questions? I'm willing to go back and, and kind of go slower if you want in any of this stuff. Yeah, so as you said, there's multiple solutions sometimes. Um, is where you begin your guess going to... Yeah, so where you begin your guess. If I have begin my, begun my guess about here, I think I'll have approached that solution instead of the other one. So what the, 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 the learning, the lesson learned here is that you're going to converge to an equilibrium state that's closest to the guess that you had because that you're basically looking at a search of the solution near that vicinity. Is there a question? Great. Uh, here's a more general 3D nonlinear formulation without going into the details and driving you nuts about it. But uh, strain equals B times Q. We covered that before. Say stress is a function of strain in a nonlinear manner. Uh, basically, your residual is going to look like this. It comes from the weak form straight. Um, I have not substituted with sigma bold is. Normally, sigma bold is what? Stiffness D times strain, and strain is B times displacement. So I'll get B, D, B, right? But here, because stress depends on strain, and strain dep dep uh, depends on displacements, non-linearly, I haven't substituted what stress is. But you can see here that the, the, the equations are basically the same. And now I can use Newton-Raphson procedure on this. That's my R now. And so when I use R, uh, I can now use the same procedure, same procedure I have here, showing you here, to solve that 3D finite element formulation. In a very simple manner, I'm really trying to. And, and here's an example of a rubber bar. Stress is a function of strain in a, in a very strange manner, by the way. This is the curve for that. You guys can go and examine this example if you want. Uh, it's not very different from this example. I just chose a different equation. Okay. Uh, but if you went through that example, um, you'll get a Newton Raphson equation uh, fairly quick. So, as we saw, what we want to do is to use Newton Raphson procedure to be able to solve a system of nonlinear equations. And that's all we did. That's what we need to do to be able to solve nonlinear equations. And that's just a purely mathematical concept. There's nothing here very special about it. What we really want to do is f determine the deflection such, as, such that the external forces are in equilibrium with the internal forces. And that residual, which is the difference between internal forces and external forces, are the ones that that residual has to get to zero and that can only be f done using Newton-Raphson procedure, which I demonstrated using a mathematical model and then I applied it to a few problems so you can see how that works. You saw how the sources of nonlinearities come from geometry, 
They come from material nonlinearities and then from contact as an example. Well, you have a great rest of your day, and I hope you enjoy this lecture.